and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. One, true prayers of the Lord's Prayer are forgiven and out of danger with the Father in heaven. But there is still the world, the flesh, and the devil here below. We must remember. We've noticed this in connection with the spirit and the flesh. The spirit is in our heart, but so is the flesh still there. And these are one against the other, working at cross purposes so we cannot do what we will. Now we're the Lord's, and we can, with justification, call, it, call God Father, and we know also that we are forgiven our debts as we forgive others as well. So we're out of danger in that sense. We've been adopted forever. We've been forgiven forever. We are God's forever. But in this world, we still have to conjure with the flesh and the devil and the world itself. Two, God's children, we are still in enemy territory and afraid. Oh God, don't lead us into temptation, we pray. The Son, capital S-O-N, prays, don't take them out of the world, but deliver them from the evil one. See, here's a dual prayer. Christ is asking that we not be delivered from the world, the flesh, and the devil by being taken out of the world and into heaven. It is not his pleasure for us to go to heaven yet. But he prays even while we are left in this world, while we are not taken out of this world, that we will be delivered from the evil one. That's his prayer, and he teaches us to pray Lead us not into temptation. So the Lord is working with God and with us simultaneously in the same purpose of our not succumbing to temptation. Three, so we his children pray, deliver us from evil. Christ is going to leave us in an evil world dominated by the evil one and with the flesh working with the evil one on our inside, as it were. So a very desperate, importunate, urgent prayer goes up from every Christian heart, deliver us from evil. We're surrounded by it. We're even surrounded within. There's more of the flesh than there is of the spirit in us. Every Christian ought to walk terrified through life. You, you would, if you didn't know that God was with us, you couldn't imagine how we could possibly survive. We wouldn't. We would fall. God is with us, but so is the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we're still very much on the alert, very much in prayer, very, very earnest, storming the gates of heaven. Deliver us from evil. Number four. If we must remain here, if you will lead us into temptation in spite of our timidity and fear, deliver us. Don't let us succumb, please. I think that's what the first part of this petition means when we say lead us not into temptation. God has left us to temptation. He is leaving us to temptation. He could deliver us out of this evil world and all temptation, but he's not doing so, and his son is not asking so. As a matter of fact, the son is saying, don't take them out of this world, but he's leaving us in a world of temptation. And since we see that as his will, and these are our circumstances, What we are praying here, I think, is if we must remain here, every one of us would prefer to go to heaven. We don't want to remain in this evil world, but God wants us to remain in this evil world because he wants us to. We want to in that sense of the word, but we're scared silly. We're really running afraid. 
And so we send up this desperate SOS to heaven, as it were. If we must remain here, if you will lead us into temptation, at least leave us to temptation, in spite of our prayer to the contrary, in spite of our timidity and fear, then please deliver us. Don't let us succumb, please. See, we've got to do our request here. We don't want the temptation. We'd like to be out of it altogether. We wish we wouldn't ever sin again, ever. But it is not God's pleasure to grant that wish of ours, and so it isn't our will either. Not my will, but thy will be done. But it's a very solemn will and a frightening will. But once again it is, give what thou commandest and command what thou wilt. If you command us to stay here, all right, but give us the ability to stay here, which means lead us not into temptation, to succumb to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Number five, God will lead us to, but not into, temptation. If we go into temptation, we are leading ourselves. If we are not delivered from evil by our Father, it is because we refuse to be delivered. We are still SODs, son of the devil. You get that? We're praying here, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And if we do actually go into temptation, God isn't leading us into it, though he leads us to the edge of it. We lead ourselves into it, and we are delivering ourselves into evil. God never delivers us into evil, but he may refuse to deliver us from evil. But if he lets us fall into temptation, succumbing to it, and actually doesn't deliver us from evil, we simply are not Christians, and it means we are not sincerely praying. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We are showing that even while we recite the Lord's Prayer, our Lord is the devil. We haven't really been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. The devil is still our Lord, and while we promise fealty to another Lord, he is not our God, as we say. We are still, as it were, fifth columnists of Satan in the church of Jesus Christ. Number six, but the Father's children are safe in the war, long wilderness journey. I think you realize when I refer to that long wilderness journey, I am alluding to the people of God after they were delivered out of Egypt. They went through a long wilderness journey of 40 years before they were permitted to enter the land of promise for which they were delivered from Egypt. But you will also remember that most of those people of God were lost in the wilderness. And what I'm saying here, though we are professed people of God who have been delivered from our Egypt according to our profession, if we fall in the wilderness as those ancient Israelites did, it only shows that we were delivered externally but never internally. We joined the church, but we never joined Christ. We were made members, but we were never born again. That we are outwardly his children, but not inwardly his children. It's a thing we must always remember when we pray. As I say, and I keep repeating, there's a temptation built into the situation to think that you're virtuous because you're engaged in a virtuous activity. Prayer is a good and a holy thing. And when one finds himself praying, he concludes that he's a good and a holy person. 
But manifestly, a person can go through the form of prayer without the spirit of prayer. He could be circumcised in the flesh, but not in the heart. He can have a heart of stone rather than a heart of flesh. He can call Christ Lord and Christ the Lord say, I never knew you. And so, my friends, we must always be on the alert. We must always be examining ourselves. And in this particular situation, when we're talking about temptation and succumbing to evil, when we pray as our Lord teaches us, because our Lord teaches us, we will not be led into temptation, permanently into temptation, and delivered over to evil. So that if we actually are succumbing to temptation, not just as a lapse, but as a practice, and are actually delivered over to evil, what we ought to realize even while we're praying is that we are not praying. As the Lord taught us to pray, we're only using the words. It's just as well for us to get off our knees and stop the hypocrisy. Number seven. They will never die, true Christians will never die in the valley of the shadow of death because no temptation has overtaken you, says the God to whom you pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That same God says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also that you may be able to endure it. There's your answer to your prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God is telling us not only that he'll answer that prayer, he's even telling us how he will answer that prayer. Look at it again. No temptation has taken you but such as is common to man. This isn't a new thing. The temptations which will befall you are common to your lot in this world. There is no human being, saint or sinner, who escapes them. There's no new temptation that you have to be on the alert to. These are the same temptations you gave yourself over to while you were in Egypt, in bondage, in sin, that now confront you. And he says, there's a new element here. The temptations remain the same. They're common to man. They don't change when you become a saint. But this is the new element that isn't common to man, but is common to the Christian man. God is faithful. God has promised that he will keep you. Our very next theme after this is the perseverance of the saints, where we'll look at this more closely. But you know now that when Christ died for you according to an eternal election of you, that God was committed to keeping you forever and ever, and God is faithful. He doesn't promise anything he will not do, and you know he is just as infinitely able as he is perfectly voracious, so that when he says he will and he can do, God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted beyond what you are able. He suffers men and women in this world who reject him, pay no attention to him, go their own way. He subjects them to these temptations and lets them fall and lets them perish in many cases, but he will not suffer you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Now, we know from Scripture as a whole that that does not mean that you will not sin at all. We've labored that point. Perfection is a heresy. 
The sinlessness of a Christian is not sinless perfection, but the fact that he will never give himself over to it. So the promise here, he will not suffer you to be tempted beyond what you are able either not to enter or to escape from if you do enter it. You understand those aren't the inspired words. Those are my comments following the inspired words. He will not suffer you to be tempted beyond what you are able. That's what it means. Not that you will never, ever yield to any temptation, but you will never be taken over by that temptation, unable to extricate yourself from it. That's what his promise is. John the Baptist doubted. He wondered whether this was the Messiah. But John was never given over to doubt. He was puzzled. He wanted illumination, and he received it. John the Baptist was no doubter. Peter denied his Lord, even three times. He succumbed to the temptation of denying his Lord. Three times he succumbed to that temptation, but he did not succumb to it as a denier. He was extricated from it. He lived as an apostle of truth, and he sealed his true witness with martyrdom. David committed adultery, but David Though he was permitted to succumb to that temptation and actually to commit this gruesome violation of the seventh commandment, he was not permitted to become an adulterer. He was brought to deep repentance, and he amended his way profoundly as he showed the justification for his title a man after God's own heart. He really loved God, though at that moment he hated him and disobeyed him and was humiliated by him. But he was not permitted to be tempted beyond what he was able to escape and overcome. That was the promise, and that's the way it was fulfilled in those men and many other men and women mentioned in the Bible and many of you may know the same to be true with yourselves. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also. With the temptation, see, we ask, lead us not into temptation. We like to be free of temptation altogether. He will not free us from temptation in this world, but he will not let us succumb the practice of the evil to which we are tempted, but will provide a way of escape also. You can see here that man as such is not able to escape his temptations. He sometimes prides himself on it. But you see, once a man prides himself on an imagined ability to cope with temptation, he has already succumbed to the temptation of pride, which is probably the most sinful deed of all. There is no way the natural man can ever escape temptation. He just falls from one temptation into another. He never escapes the temptation. Now, the saint will not escape being tempted, but he will escape falling into it, being taken over by it. A way of escape will be provided by God, and the implication is, unless God provided it, I'd be a goner, and so would you. The same temptations that face everybody in this world face me, and they face you. And it isn't because I have more moral muscle, or more experience of the grace of God, or more years of teaching the truth of God, or more people praying for me, or something like that. There's one reason, and one reason only, why I escape temptation. If I do escape temptation, it is because God provides me with a way of escape. What the way of escape may be, he doesn't tell us here. 
I know what some of my ways of escapes are. You know what some of your ways of escapes are. The one thing we know is common to all of us. If we're in Christ Jesus, a way of escape will be provided so that we will not succumb to the practice of any evil. Once again, if we succumb to the practice of any evil, we're not Christians because God has promised us that he's faithful to his people and he'll not allow this to happen and a way of escape will be provided. I have a friend who's a practicing homosexual. He knows homosexuality is a sin. He knows as long as he practices it, he is not a Christian. He's under the wrath and judgment of God. He's utterly convinced of that. And he consults with me and other ministers and so on. Ask for guidance, to ask for hope. The last time I saw the man, he lives miles and miles away from me. Please don't laugh and please don't condone. But this is a true story and it's a miserable story. But the last time I saw that man, he said to me, Dr. Gershner, I've got it down to three times a week. Is there any hope? You know what he meant by that? He knows it's a sin. He knows it's got to be overcome. And he knows when he asked me, is there any hope? Is there any hope that I've been born again? That God has really had mercy on me? Is that any indication because I made some progress against it? That man used to wallow in it. So he might say, don't laugh when he says he gets it down to three days a week. It sounds incredible, but he means it. He's fighting against it. He's asking a Christian pastor, is there any way by which he can help he's a Christian? Of course, I couldn't give him any consolation on that. That's a definition of a practicing homosexual. He knows it as well as I know it, so on. You get what I'm driving at, don't you? You can't say because a man succumbed to adultery on one occasion or succumbed to homosexuality on one occasion, or told a gruesome lie on another occasion, or stole some money on another occasion, that he's not a Christian. But a thief is a, not a Christian, and a practicing homosexual is not a Christian, and a practicing fornicator is not a Christian, and a practicing liar is not a Christian, as we said as we went through the commandments and so on. He's not a Christian because God is faithful and he will provide a way of escape. And if, he, if there's no way of escape and you're immersed in the practice, you have to draw the same grim conclusion that man had to draw and I had to agree with him. He's not been born again. He's still seeking and I'm hoping God will have mercy on him and make him over again. And when God has mercy upon him, he will not be a practicing homosexual anymore. It may be a very, very difficult thing for him to escape, but God is faithful and he has promised and he will provide a way of escape, whatever the sin may be that besets any individual whatever. Number eight, in the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Also in the world you have temptation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the temptation. You understand the first words are the words of my Lord. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The latter phrase is my parody on it, but I think it does certainly grow out of the teaching of Holy Scripture that the Lord is saying the equivalent of the statement in the world you have temptation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the temptation. I mean, I have provided you with a way of, of, of escape. It's a solemn warning on the one hand that we would never escape it except by his power. As I say, any of us who think that we have that much moral goodness in us, that we are incapable of whatever crime you may mention, I lose some friends on this particular point, I maintain about myself and yourself. There is absolutely no unmentionable, filthy crime, indespicable crime that could be committed of which I am not capable and you are not capable. 
The flesh is the flesh, and out of the flesh comes the flesh. And it could be any kind of enormity, and the only thing that keeps anybody back from any of those is either the providential mercy of God or the saving mercy of God who is faithful and will not allow us to succumb, but will provide a way of escape from it. That's the only reason. We may boast if we're in Christ, but that boasting is going to be in Christ. If we ever boast in ourselves, we are not in Christ. And we will soon stop the boasting when we realize where we are headed. Nine, like old Ulysses, we will have ourselves tied to the mast by our father when we sail past the island of the sirens. So we teach that is the most severe discipline necessary is quite compatible with the divine promise he'll provide a way of escape. Just because he's going to provide the way of escape doesn't mean that we can just glibly glide along, confident that he will not let us succumb. You remember that figure of that wise old Greek, Ulysses, knowing how dangerous this island of sirens was, that he was determined that he couldn't succumb to them. He had it tied to the mast, and he had his eyes and ears stopped. We'll do the same sort of thing. We know the temptations which surround us, We'll do everything in our power, but our ultimate confidence will not be in our power or our devices. Our ultimate confidence will be in the promise of God that he will provide us a means of escape even when the means of escape which he provides us is of our own devising. It will be his making our devisings effective which alone count for them being effective, not our ingenuity. But again, like old Jason, we will have the sweet singer of songs, Jesus, to charm our ears and close them to the siren call. So we please, I'm just referring to ancient Greek mythology here, history mythology here, as to the way by which we escape the temptation and recognize that the way of escape was provided by God himself. We make it as impossible as we can to succumb to the temptation which we know awaits us, and we walk as closely to Christ as we can because his attractiveness would make temptation appear what it really is, repulsive and distasteful. So simultaneously, we go through this world tied to the mast, unable to yield to sin, and at the same time, our ears are tuned to the sweet music of Jesus, which is so attractive that the world becomes ugly and untempting.